The model can be right, but for the wrong reason. You won't realize that, oh, there's some data leakage in the model. Everyone's going after AGI. What's the closest we have to AGI? They'd say, oh, a large language model. The amount of information that's packed into language with all its complexity is nothing in, in the terms of, of learning to what we learn by simply experiencing the world through our, all our senses. That's quite interesting. The, we are such strong simulation engines and we act because we've explored this space with a very different set of criteria than let's say a machine learning model with you know one equation one set of parameters can pick up we're talking about all these things we understand them we know they're important we kind of know how they work but the, the the actual bringing into reality is is the difficult part so for, at least for me personally i now measure myself in terms of if i can build a product out of it i understand it if i can't build a product out of it then i, I don't fully understand it and that's that's been a new guiding light for me recently we all should be doing that i think the way the way data science is taught, machine learning is taught, is often wrong. Here's a, the simplest example of this. So one of the hardest problems in training LLMs is the training data mixtures. How much of Reddit, how much of Wikipedia, how much of, how much Python code, how much C code should I put into this model to give it some actualized intelligence for a domain? Do you think that LLMs themselves can be used to, to interpret what the best training data mixture is for LLMs? So it's this kind of a inception kind of thing. So if, if you give it access to unlimited amount of compute, could probably do that. I mean, you would end up with a very expensive bill. So welcome to episode 12 of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to get to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today we have Serge Massis. He's a top authority on interpretable machine learning. His 600-page book, Interpretable Machine Learning with Python, was voted one of the best AI books of all time by Book Authority. He's a lead data scientist at Sagenta, a top agricultural company working on global food security. And he's a former webmaster and web designer. Serge, I'm grateful to have you on the show. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. This is, yeah, yeah. This is going to be, I think, one of my toughest interviews to prepare for. Um, just because I know that you're, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you're so good at asking questions and I didn't want to disappoint you. And for those that are listening, if you don't know, you not listen to the Super Data Science podcast, I highly recommend you go listen to it. And Serge is a major contributor to a lot of the technical questions that you see on that show. Um, so I think you can, you can learn a lot. And Serge, at the end, I'm going to ask you to give me a, a rating on my questions out of 10. So, you, uh, so feel free. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, so feel free to tell me I'm absolute yeah. trash. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about continuous improvement. And so I, I figured we would play a fun game in this interview. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So to begin, what does it mean for a machine learning system to be interpretable? And I'm saying machine learning system versus a machine learning model. I, I, I wanted to give that abstraction. Okay. There's, there's well, two kind of, um, two definitions. And, and they're, they're often used interchangeably, but they're, you know, like, uh, especially in academic circles, they'll get really angry if you mix them up. Um, I, I don't, I don't care. I have a preference, but you know, like one of them has to do with how well you can understand the internal workings of a model. And as models get more, more and more complex, that becomes harder thing to do to holistically understand a model. I mean, even the ones that in theory, you can really dissect because it's just a mathematical equation. The longer the question, the less you understand it. I mean, maybe it's not just a question of sheer complexity of the math, because you know, a, a, lin you know, a, a linear model isn't, you know, necessarily like difficult math, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but if you have like you know, I don't know, fifty variables, how could you possibly understand that holistically? Yep. You just can't. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, and especially if you get into, okay, well, you made like a, a, a polynomial, uh, you know, regression one, uh, or something like that, then it's just, you know, that you call it interpretable. Yeah. But it, it kind of is, and it is right. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's one definition. And then the other one is, okay. Um, just simply explaining it, uh, you know, able to explain 
why it makes its definitions. Um, it, its definitions as its predictions. So it's not so much of what's inside the black box, but how the input and output are connected and have some kind of theory of how they're connected based on, you know, the the effects you see, the the relationships you see um, simply by connecting those variables. So you don't know what's inside the box. You just know how to kind of connect the dots once you've seen the predictions. You know, you throw some things in, you see what comes out, and you're like, okay, I have a theory about the connection. So uh, where, I, where I stand on that, usually, like people call interpretable machine learning, you know, uh, they call that the, you know, the, the intrinsically interpretable mm-hmm. models. You know, we're, we're talking linear regression, um, you know, all what they would call white box models usually fall under that category, the dishes and trees, you know. Um, and then the, the, the other ones, the gradient boosted distribution trees, like XGBoost, CatBoost, and all that, that would go under the black box umbrella. It has a lot more complexity to it. So that would be ex- explainable AI. So you got interpretable machine mm-hmm. learning for the white box and then explainable AI for the other one. I honestly think it should be the, the terms should be flipped in the sense that I, I don't think you, when you tell me you can explain something, you, you truly understand it. That's, that's my feeling mm-hmm. about it. Um, interpreting, you know, is something we've, we do all the time in data science with, with not a hundred percent certainty, you know, like even, even data analysts and anybody in analytics is familiar with the term interpreting. It's not even a, necessarily like a, a scientific, intrinsically scientific term, but it's just, okay, I have this information and I, I'm trying to kind of glean some kind of insights from, it, you know, based on my domain knowledge on the subject and whatnot, but it doesn't mean I, I know 100% what's, you know, inside the guts of the machine, if you will. But explaining to me has like a higher threshold for what it means to understand. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I, I, I kind of think, okay, well, if I were to use the word explain, I would say, okay, well, I can explain uh, a simple, simple linear regression model. <laughs> I can explain a decision tree, uh, you know, but then a neural network is something I would interpret, mm. you know? So I, I have those terms flipped. Yep. Um, and, and originally there were two camps, you know, people called one thing by interpretation, another one explanation, but, you know, right now it's just like uh, gone in the other direction. So interpretable machine learning has become more, more of a ca- academic term that is used for like the stuff that is intrinsically interpretable and explainable AI is, is more like the, uh, you know, uh, post hoc, what they call post hoc interpretability. So that's, uh, you know, explaining things on, on just by connecting the dots, as I, I said earlier. And, and to me, it's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with post hoc interpretability. It doesn't have the same level of certainty because obviously you, you either don't know what's inside the black box or it's just too complex to actually make sense mm-hmm. of it in, a, you know, in the same way you would uh, with interpretal, uh, intrinsically interpretable models. But it, it's no different than asking a human to explain their decisions. You know, it's, it, it's, it's better than nothing. That's what I think, mm-hmm. you know, like, um, so obviously like if, if you use different, different, uh, different methods and they all point in the same direction, you got a good sign that, you, you know, you, you have some hypothesis that you can probably glean from it, you know, that's, that's what I, I think about that. I don't, I don't like say, okay, well, you, you have to use it with, uh, with the purpose of, of having a hundred percent certainty. It's just like a question of, you know, if you use, uh, say a feature importance method to see what features are more important in your model, and then you use another one and it, 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 it comes up with a, more or less the same list, uh, but say like the top three are the the same in both mm-hmm. lists, then you can say, okay, well, it, it seems to be indicating that the, the top three are these in this order, right. you know? Right. So 
I mean, I would trust that if I use different methods mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, especially if you use them to the highest level of like that you can, you know, because you can use different settings with these uh, methods where you're, you're, you're actually uh, trying to get the highest, uh, I mean, the lowest amount of error, the highest level of fidelity. And um, if you do that, then you can be more certain of your results. That makes sense. So does it, so it, it sounds like for a, a system to be interpretable, it does not necessarily have to be simple to understand. Is, am I understanding that correctly? That's a, uh, that's, that's my, that's my interpretation of interpretable. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, because I mean, if, if you're looking at intrinsically interpretable and post hoc interpretability, which is the way I see it, I mean, uh, post hoc interpretability does not have to be a simple model. It can be a, a really large model mm. and you can still make some sense of it. Can you, um, can you articulate and, a and, definition of post hoc interpretability again? Post hoc interpretability is, is when you, you, you use like any kind of method to understand the, the inner workings of the model after it's already made a prediction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're using the predictions to understand the connection with the gotcha. inputs. And then you can't, you can't um, necessarily go back and technically mess with inputs to get inner workings of the system. You just kind of have to trust it as observations you're, you're getting in the wild. Yeah. Like for instance, yeah. Like if, if I were to give you, you know, uh, a million weights, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and say, okay, make sense of this, you know, bunch of numbers, you'd be like, okay, I, I can't really do that. I mean, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's, but if, if you start like to throw inputs in it, say it's, it's a convolutional neural network and you know, it accepts an image because you've, you've seen the, you only have the weights, you have also the structure. Yes. And so, you know, okay, well it, it takes in an image that's 256 times 256. So I'm going to throw in a bunch of images and use these different methods to see, you know, what if I change this pixel? What if I change this other one? Mm -hmm. So forth. I see. And so <laughs> eventually you, you start to gain an understanding of, okay, it seems to be making more, these kind of pixels, you know, these kinds of values seem to be making these kinds of predictions yeah. versus these ones. That makes sense. So that's, that's post hoc interpretability. Hmm. And that's, it's, it's sounding like in, in that case, the quality of my interpretability is bounded by the exploration. Excuse me. Yeah, it's bounded by the, um, the breadth of inputs that I have to, to test the bounds of the system. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's no different to a lot of methods that have been used for a long okay. time. Like you could say the same thing about sensitivity analysis or any other method that we've already used in, in many other systems to understand it. Obviously, uh, exploration is bounded by my search scope, okay. you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. like in any system I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, um, you know, what are like the parameters that, you know, optimize this or anything of that nature. I'm also limited by, by that decision that I make initially which, how should I do this? How should I go about like exploring the system? And this is no different to that. There's a human element to that. It, it's not only like the interpretation aspect to it, but it's also, as you, you very uh, eloquently mentioned, like the exploration. So, so, so EDA is the same mm -hmm. thing, you know, when you think about it, people put a lot of trust in EDA, right. you know, and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna understand my data. But something that might shock you is I often understand my data through models. Mm. You know, it's, it's often a more efficient way of understanding the data. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Expand on that. That means that, that means that sometimes, you know, like I'll go only so far in doing like the EDA before I've, I've started like putting it in a model hmm. in understanding, okay, these are the features that pop out. These are the, this is like, not only 
because one thing is to look like a, a correlation uh, heat map. Another thing is to actually use it in the model and realize, okay, it goes a lot deeper than that. Like there's these three or four variables that are interacting amongst mm -hmm. each other in this way, you know? And uh, so there's multiple levels. And this feature that seemed to be very useful by variantly, you know, interacting with this one and this other one, it's not in the model. The mo it's, it's completely redundant because this feature seems to have the same, um, the same kind of elements to it. And why is that? So, I mean, that's part of the exploration process is to ask that question why. If you don't ask that question why, you can't go further into it. And that's perhaps one of them I think people misunderstand about, you know, all these like subgenres of 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 um of data science, which are like have to do with responsible AI, explainable AI. Like they all think, okay, it's all like ethics stuff, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't necessarily apply to you unless you're like, you know, involved in something that is public facing or involves people information or anything like that. No, that's not true. I mean, it is after all, uh, a good practice. If, if you're, if you're trying to be data centric, if you're trying to squeeze the most that you can out of your data, then you have to do that because it's how you actually get there because the models will lead you lead the way and tell you how to improve the, improve the data right if you follow that you know uh um crumb trail yeah yeah uh you know you have to kind of follow that through to get there and it's a practice in quality assurance mm -hmm, as well mm -hmm. so it's good for business because it's how you get to optimize models and it's how you ensure good you know good quality because after all the model can be right but for the wrong reasons the model can be right and, for the wrong reasons yep mm -hmm. yeah so when that happens you'll you'll think your model the metrics will all show that your model is okay and that's all you're looking at you won't realize that oh there's some data leakage in the model or there's there's some kind of uh confounding variable that for some reason is connecting things, but you know, under other circumstances, it's not going to work. Um, the example that I give is like there, there, there was this famous case of, of a model that, that um, I, I don't know under what circumstances. I like to tell the story that it was for you know sheep farmers, but you know, I, I don't really know if it was for sheep farmers, but it's a, it's a um, box prediction model okay. so a uh, fox classification mm. so it was uh looking at images uh you know that a camera would pick up of a fox and, and say okay is it the fox or a dog because the dogs are allowed in with the mm, sheep that's a good point they heard the yep. sheep but the, the foxes aren't right so um or was it wolves i don't know. probably could be the all maybe it was wolves <laughs> yeah yeah well the, the point is uh the, the the model was trained with images all the most of the images of wolves had snow in them ah, so okay. in it, it would work in theory and, and it would work if, if you deployed it in in the winter maybe it would work but under other conditions it would <laughs> so um they, they they realized it was it was not working and it was right for the wrong mm -hmm. reason right, so I, I like this fact that you're bringing up eda is not about just exploring the data. EDA is about modeling, leveraging the data in a modeling process to get a better understanding of your interaction effects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, I wouldn't say it. it is about the data. Okay. But the model will tell you about mm, the data. I like that. I mean, a lot of people will caution, okay, don't jump too soon into modeling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, they're, they're, they're right in the sense that modeling as already, okay, I'm jumping to the conclusions that this is. This is my. Uh, this is how I'm going to go through the process. And if you have that mindset, that is okay. I'm engineering the solution. Yeah, of course. If you jump too quickly into modeling with that mindset, yeah, you're 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 never going to do a very good job at the ADA because you're just going to rush into okay. I'm going to do it this way. A one, two, three, four, and mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. But if you have an exploration mindset, you know 
dare I say, more a scientific mindset, then you're you're not gonna it's it's not gonna be a problem because it's it's all it's gonna be iterative. You're you're gonna start you're gonna model with just that with just that the premise that you're you're just trying to extract some information from the yep. data. You're just trying to make it confess a few things. Hmm. That's all. Trying to make it confess. And and that's not necessarily a finished product. Right. You know, maybe you're you're you you know from the get go you're you're doing an NLP model, but you know, and you're and 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 it's this kind of maybe it's a classifier, maybe it's something else, but your your model is you know a cluster model or it's something else or or you're trying to connect some regression uh, variable to some you know and text embedding you know so you're. You're ne not necessarily even close to doing what the task that you're planning to do, but your model is designed in such a way where you're you're trying to get some information yes. from mm -hmm. that, from from the variables that you have to work with. Hmm. I like that a lot, actually. But here's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm your client, okay? So I run this fictitious company. I have a hundred models in production. Yeah. Um, I didn't necessarily tell you exactly what type of models I have yet, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So with these 100 models in various forms, I have no interpretability, let's call it an interpretability protocol. I have none of those in place. Um, some powers that be yeah. came down and said, all my models need to be interpretable. What should I be thinking of yeah. in the next 6 to 12 months to, <laughs> to make some progress? It's a loaded question, but I just kind of wanted to frame more of an industry. Um, Okay. It depends. If, if you're in like a reg heavy regulated industry, mm -hmm. if they tell you they need interpretable models, chances are they need, uh, you know, something intrinsically interpretable. Okay. So if you have any models that are, uh, you know, XGBoost or like uh, some kind of neural net, you know, you just, you can't use them. Mm. Um, and 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 the argument there is okay. Well, what is more ethical, um, an accurate model that you don't understand, uh, or one that is less accurate that you do? Um, and so there is a middle ground. Hmm. There's been tried to make models that are somewhere in between the level of performance and the and also at the same time. The accuracy, I mean, the level of performance and interpretability, the intrinsic interpretability yes. that comes with, you know, a simpler model. And, and, and those usually tend to come in, in the form of, or they have something, uh, you know, that is more like it has an additive property, you know, so it's, it's like linear regression, but maybe there's kind of a spin mm -hmm. to it. Usually it's like that, um, but with with the uh, with the boosting mechanism that you know we already come to love in ensemble models and ensemble decision trees. So like there's a lot of models that are mm -hmm. like that, um, and and they're used quite a bit in, in finance, finance yeah. uh, because they need that performance, mm -hmm. but they also need to interpret the models. Yes. So um, th that's what's tip. You know, some people call them glass box models. Uh, there's a library called Interpret. Um, by Microsoft, mm -hmm. and and they have one in there, and then there's um, I forget off, off the top of my head, but there's there's also one by uh, Wells Fargo. That would make um, sense. They did one, <laughs> yeah. They did one also very good. Um, uh, yeah, I'm I you yeah I'm trying to look it up. Um, they're, they have a really nice library for that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I forget the name, but they, they have some pretty good models for that. And um, let's see, uh, Gaminet, Gaminet is one. Mm. Um, Gaminet, it's, it's, uh, it's called Generalized Additive Model with Structured Interactions. Hmm. Um, and then they have another one called Self-Explain. Uh, they have several models like that. Uh, well, and um, and some of them are actually neural nets, but okay. the the way these neural net works is is very controlled. Mm -hmm. So the the kind of interactions that are controlled, 
And you can do the same things actually with other kinds of models. I mean, I could, I could train uh, a cat boost and tell it, okay, I only, I only want, um, I, I only want these, these variables have to be monotonic, mm -hmm. right? And, and monotonicity is, is, is very important for explainability. Um, hmm, why? You why know, is that? And, and that, why? I mean, uh, I... like, if I told you, if I told you, like, when this variable increases, this, this outcome also always increases. That makes sense. Yeah. That is very easy to understand. And if it, if it weren't like mm -hmm. that, you would have to wonder why. Why is that an exception? That that doesn't that doesn't jive well for yeah. us. That's that's kind of counterintuitive. It makes it suspicious, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that there are exceptions. Um, you know, it could be uh, if it's if it's in the kind of application where you would use the term fair, you'd say, well, you know, that doesn't seem fair. Why would it dip? You know, or in in other application, maybe it would make okay, well that that's kind of odd you know like if i told you okay like the risk of heart disease increases with age uh except between the ages of you know 57 and 60. Mm -hmm. you say well that seems arbitrary you know it says well that's what the model says it's like no that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. why would be that the case you know maybe it would be the case because you have some kind of weird outliers well in that group of, over there and you don't have enough data you know, mm -hmm. maybe you don't have enough data for that group, you know, so it, it, it's like, okay, I don't have enough data, but that's not, that doesn't mean that in the real world, that's not something we've, we've seen, you know, that it increases with age. So you would want to enforce a monotonic constraint on that variable to ensure that it was working in a way that, that made sense according to our domain mm -hmm. knowledge, despite it being not indicative in our data right yeah <laughs> we can do things like that so does that apply and, quick question does that apply from the perspective of um, like i'm thinking of a rubber band if you look at the tensile strength of a rubber band it has an upper limit so even though it can be technically monitor um, excuse me, monotonically increasing in terms of the the more i stretch it uh, the more force is applied or, or, or the more tension that i sort of get the, the greater the distance that I stretch this object, but beyond a certain point, boom, this thing will snap. So if I can look at that curve, it's an upward facing curve, but there's the upper limit. Do upper limits sort of apply in this framework of? No, no. It, I mean, if it has, if it doesn't decrease at any point, then it's monotonic. If it, if it plateaus, it's still, still monotonic. monotonic. Okay. It just plateaus. Gotcha. I mean, um, yeah, there are ways to kind of enforce constraints. Mm -hmm for some models where you have a kind of a unimodal kind of dynamics where it increases and then decreases, you know, but these, these kind of phenomena, you know, you don't necessarily see them quite as often as monotonicity. Okay. So um, it, it's what makes sense. And in a sense, it, it kind of makes things, when you find these kind of counterintuitive relationships, they're indicative also of things that are, you know, that aren't causal. Right as well, mm. so you 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 want to find consistency in the data because consistency the consistency indicates uh, uh, causal relationships and by exclusion also counterfactual ones. So you, you said causal two times. So what is what is yeah. talk to us about causality? I, I think causal reasoning and and why that's important and. It's it's been seeming to get a lot more popular in the past two or three years, and maybe why why yeah. is that? Why? Because there's nothing more explainable than causality. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we'd like to see, we'd like to claim that we can find causality in data, mm. but I mean, by itself, data is not indicated indicating any causality. The only thing that makes things causal is, you know, our understanding of that data. Hmm. So if we, we know for a fact that, you know, like say I have machinery data and I know for a fact that, you know, the faster the, the water spigot, you know, spews out water and this other thing 
this will turn faster. You know, I know that that relationship is understood. Mm -hmm. So when I see that machinery data and I see it, you know, indicate that I'm like, okay, there's a causal relationship between this variable and this variable, right? The velocity of this and the, the amount of flow of water from here, it, they're, they're connected. Yes. So to me, that's what makes it causal, right? But when, when you have someone that doesn't have the domain knowledge look at that, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, that doesn't, you know, they're not seeing, they're seeing a correlation. That's all they're seeing. And that's all it can indicate. And there might be other confounding variables that we have in that mix that, that don't really add to anything. They're just bystanders. They, they connect in different ways. And, and there might be some anomalies that we don't know as anomalies. So they don't show necessarily as the strongest correlation because we have those anomalies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and there's also missing variables, ones that we don't have. Right. So like, if you're just looking at the data, you, you don't get that. So that's, that's why it's important as data scientists for us to look at the data generation process, because mm -hmm. that's, that's the missing link. If we have the data generation process, then we can connect the dots. Of course, not everything is as simple as machinery data. <laughs> I mean, um, obviously you have data in, you know, involves social interactions and things like that. It doesn't get more complicated than that. This is just so many missing variables. You know, I, I didn't know what you ate for breakfast. I don't know, you know, what kind of mood you're in. I don't know any of that. So if, if you're just a number in some spreadsheet somewhere and I'm trying to find some connection between, you know, your data point and some variable and, and as in addition to everybody else's data points, and I mean, it's, it's going to be complicated because there's just so much missing yeah. information. Hmm. Um, that being said, uh, one, one trick, and this is why like in, 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 uh, in the Judah Pearl's like book, um, there's like three ladders. So you jump from like a, a correlation to counterfactual reasoning from counterfactual to causal. And so this is what it's called the ladder. And which book um, is this? Calls, by the way? I think he calls the ladder, uh, the book of oh, why. The book of why. Okay. Yeah. And so um, counterfactual reasoning is really important because, and it's, it's super simple. Okay. Like we, we all know it from a young age in the sense that like, if we find an exception to a rule, the rule no longer applies, mm. you know, I mean, I'm not talking necessarily like a rule, like from your parents, I'm talking like of something has to do with the natural world, yes. you know, and the way things work. So if we find an exception to something, we're like, okay, there's something odd about that. Or, and then that's how we craft new rules, but not necessarily contradicting the previous one. Yep. So uh, it could involve the way, the way light bounces off, or reflects something. So we find, okay, this is a material that's not reflective. Uh, or it could be, you know, like, observing gravity, observing like uh, interactions between people, you know, um, things like that. So we start to find causal relationships. Like we realize, okay, when, when someone says hi, the appropriate response is to say something to the effect of hi back, right? right? Uh, that's a polite say. So there's, there's some kind of um, action and kind of response. Mm -hmm or action reaction situation. And there's a causal link between both. So it's, mm -hmm. it's obviously data wise, if you don't know any of that, like you're going to find that relationship in, in transcript transcripts of thousands of conversations. Mm -hmm. So it's, to me, it's no wonder, like, you know, if you say hi to a large language model, it's going to say hi back. Right. Right. Um, but it, the, the difference is that we understand much more context. And we understand the, the counterfactuals to that situation, mm -hmm. you know, yes. which are like, okay, there, there's different way. What if it's, it's in a mean tone, you know, or what if it's, if it's screamed or, you know, like, obviously that's not something that necessarily is transmitted through text mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. there's, there's so many, so much nuance 
to to causality. No, I like the fact that um, you brought this up, and it, it made me think about uh, one of the things that stuck out was this uh, this notion of causality might require domain knowledge, and and one example of that may be. I don't know, gravity <laughs> or in like in a manufacturing process. So I worked in railroad industry and we're doing a ton of data analytics of let's say signals that occur um, in the rails. So if most people don't know that mm-hmm. the actual rail is the communication system, especially in, in freight railroads, they, mm. there's no other communication system. So they just communicate down the rails, sending signals back and forth. And if you interrupt mm-hmm. those signals, you, you get fine a couple hundred K. Uh, if you, if you mess with people's mm-hmm. tracks, um, but when I was working on that, I had I spent a lot of time with the railroad engineers understanding the physical phenomena of how trains work, how tracks work, and how electricity conducts across this non-uniform material with weather and all of those things. And that that in itself helped me to explain what was happening in the data. And I don't think I would have been able to do that without that domain knowledge. So now it it now I'm receiving as to, as to why causality is important because it, it, yeah. it almost grounds what you're observing to a degree. Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and so to circle back into your original question, the reason causality is, is a hot topic is that um, it is very applicable to a lot of industries to, to kind of skip correlation-based models and go directly to causal modeling and the the difference is in in you know just i'm oversimplifying yeah. it uh i mean there's a very good book by alexander malik that kind of uh about causal machine mm-hmm. learning that explains this far better and not only that but you know the application of it but um it can it can mostly be explained as a dag so I direct a silic graph, um, hmm. and so it's it's directed. Uh, correlation is goes both ways. Okay. Right. So you don't know which variable affects the other. It kind of affects which Interesting. one. Interesting. Or how they affect them, but causality is it? Causality goes in one direction. Ooh. So if you have a graph of how your variables interact you can model that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you can even use machine learning to do that oh that's super interesting and you also had me thinking a lot about <laughs> where causality will break down in terms of i think i wrote down existive data versus generative data and what i mean by that um, existive data could be a monitoring some output of a physical system some plant running or some yeah. manufacturing process. That's data that's mm-hmm. sort of existing in that system versus generative. Hey, why did I react yesterday to when Surge uh, called me an island boy because I'm from Trinidad and Tobago? And, <laughs> and understanding what was yeah. my state in that day, what was my priors? And there's so much, I think, instantaneous variables that are unique to an individual that... Um, I think, I guess, causality might break yeah. down or, or be a lot tougher in, in, in a case like that because it might not be <laughs> directed. I like the directed thing too. That makes me think a lot. Yeah. No, and something really interesting about causality, at least the ways we humans and, and part of what it means to be have this kind of intelligence is that we, we can simulate mm. uh, situations. So sometimes we act a certain way because we know that we act an opposite way, we'll a get bad a bad outcome. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, but, and, and you could say, well, a model can kind of do that because it has a reward kind of mechanism. Mm. It has a loss function. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but the difference is like, we actually can connect a bunch of different circumstances. We can simulate so many different circumstances mm-hmm. And chain them together um, in a way, you know, so far I haven't seen any model do that. Um, it's, it's like um, creating, well, they ca- call it like uh, having a digital twin or having some kind of uh, thing that we, we you know, uh, a model of the real world that we manipulate in mm-hmm. our mind. Uh, but, you know, 
we do it sparsely. It's not like you're manipulating the entire world. We're just manipulating the part of the world that's affected by the circumstance we're living in. Yeah, yeah. And um, huh. it can be it can be as simple as okay, I I I'm what if I kick the ball this way or kick the ball that way? You know, say I'm playing uh, football or or how they call it in the U.S. Yeah. Doctor. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. You could you could if you kick the ball a certain way, you're going to get one outcome. You do it the other one, and we we do that fairly quickly. But it could be something like a social interaction, mm-hmm. which is a lot more complex. Yes, you know. What if I tell so-and-so this and th- what if they tell that this other person and you start kind of, uh, you know, that might not lead to a good outcome, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know so, what makes me think on this thread, you know, that as everyone's going after AJI, right? And that, that if we, if we put a definition on AJI as it's just you and I talking and, and I like this, this notion that you bring up about simulation. Cause I just thought about, I'm simulating having a tough conversation with a group of people. And then in that simulation in my head, I can picture an environment. I could picture their emotions based on my prior understanding of each of their personalities. I could even bring smell into that simulation. I could bring so many other, yeah. you know, sound, as you, you mentioned, tone, et cetera, et cetera. So our, our yeah. ability to simulate across multiple modalities in, I won't say infinite, uh, what you call it, uh, infinite discretizations of a space, like all, all the different smells that someone could smell, or you know, there's it's it's typically discrete or bounded. Um, that, I, that's quite interesting that, that we are such strong simulation engines, and we act because we've explored the space with a very different set of criteria than, let's say, a machine learning model with you know, one equation or one set of parameters can pick up. So that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and the thing is that the pinnacle of, of our like machine learning exploration experiment um, as humanity has been large language models. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, like if someone, if you were to ask, you know, a layman or even some experts alike, and say, okay, what's what's the closest we have to AGI? They'd say, oh, a large language right. model, and and that's not to diminish the huge amount of mm-hmm. effort mm-hmm. And, and the amount of years of research has taken to get to that point. It's it's nothing in the sense that I mean, uh, I think John LeCun said it recently. Said like the the amount of information that's packed into language. I mean, with all its complexity, um, it's nothing in in the terms of of learning to what we learn mm-hmm. by simply experiencing the world through our, all our senses. Yeah. You know, just the the bandwidth of information that comes through our eyes, through our ears, through our touch. You know, is you know through our taste buds is like thousands of times, no, millions of times more intense than the bandwidth that we get through language, whether spoken or thought or read or anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Language is just like what he called the icing on the cake. It's just, uh, we still need the cake. Yeah. (laughs) Um, hmm. That's what we need for AGI. And that experience, it's not just multimodal. Like you can make the more complex, like multimodal Mm -hmm, model. mm -hmm. And a lot of people are claiming, oh, well, you know, OpenAI already did a model that, you know, it understands physics um, as, um, who is it, uh, the CEO of NVIDIA said, you know, I, I'm sure he just was hyping it up. He probably understands it a lot better, but, you know, he says something akin to during his keynote last week that, uh, you know, like the model understands physics because it got all this information from, um, from videos. Yep. So therefore, like it, it understands that, if if you punch through a you know wall, you're you're you're, you're not going to punch through a wall, right. right? And I'm like, that doesn't really make a lot of hmm. sense because you know, like, first of all, it would have to have a causal understanding, which is not necessarily going to be gleaned by video. Also, you know, who's to say the wall isn't fake? There's you know, there's videos probably out there of of people actually punching through walls, gotcha. right? 
you know, mm. even, oh, you know, even if you say, well, the exception is if it's, if it's shaped like a pitcher, you know, the object that's going through and it, it has Kool-Aid, then it's, it can punch through a wall, right? <laughs> um, even if you have those exceptions in there, it still doesn't make sense physically mm -hmm. that you wouldn't necessarily understand that. I mean, you would have to understand, okay, what's the material of the wall? There's much more to that. And so I think it's, it's a question of not just that kind of data, but also experiencing it. Yeah. So at least later on during the keynote, he discussed, you know, robots experiencing the world and like, okay, that seems to be closer to the road to AGI than just feeding it all the videos in the world, right. you know? Um, I mean, it's, it's like akin to, okay, I don't know if you ever watched Splash, um, you know, the movie with Tom Hanks and um, it's a very old okay. movie. But it it has uh, it's about Tom Hanks encounters this uh, mermaid, mm -hmm. very beautiful mermaid, and uh, and they uh, and she doesn't know a word of English, and he sits her in front of a TV for I don't know ten hours, or she finds herself she gets lost and finds herself in front of in a, a TV in some kind of uh, you know I don't know TV star or whatever, <laughs> and and just sits there for ten hours. And then by the end of it, she already speaks English. Mm. It's just completely ridiculous. Yes. I mean, I don't know. No matter how intelligent the person would be, I, I just don't see that happening. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's definitely sort of a long way to go. My, my definition of AGI, I'll, I'll know we've reached AGI, is when uh, this, this robot could go speak to a Jamaican and completely understand what that Jamaican is saying in all of their natural language and all of their slang and... When that happens, it's it's really interesting. Yeah. Every time someone brings out something uh, in terms of a model, I'm like, okay, I'm a Caribbean person. Let's test this model, especially speech to text. I, I have a lot of fun with that because it. <laughs> I think the accent, two things that you brought up, at least in the context of language, tonality, um, accent, that can be so, so much information and intent um, it's not necessarily applicable for, let's say, a factual-based question. That's <laughs> your, your tone of a factual-based question is still factual-based question, but I, I, I like that you highlighted um, some extra dimensions to explore. Yeah. Uh, so, Absolutely. So you wrote, I, you wrote a 600-page book on interpretable machine learning. Um, so it's covered traditional methods, deep learning. You've done causal modeling in there. Many other topics, I highly recommend folks to, uh, to get the book and digest it. Um, I haven't fully digested the book. Uh, but now we're in this LLM age. How, was, how are you seeing LLMs being used to maybe interpret models or interpret data? Oh, okay. I, I think I, I have used it Ooh, for that. Okay. It's, okay. it's not terrible mm. at, at doing that. It's not terrible. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't trust it okay. <laughs> doing the whole the whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. I mean, I one of the most interesting applications of LNMs is precisely that. I think it's the best. It's it's not just a question of okay, interpret this data. It's just a question of to me. It's a lot mm -hmm. of people often say, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, let's just ask questions, just prompt engineer the hell mm -hmm. out of it and extract information. To me, it's always kind of amazing that I know in a, in a few gigabytes worth of, 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 of numbers, um, you know, of weights, you know, we, we actually have a model that can give us out like facts about the world mm -hmm. and speak in a, in a, in a semi normal way. Right. That to me is kind of amazing, but that's not, really the most exciting thing about a large language model to me it's it's okay i can give it like data uh, of any kind uh, i can give it a, like a chunk of text a json file or something and ask it to correspond with someone in plain english kind of interpret it for lack of a better word or reinterpret yes. it kind of uh regurgitate it in english to me that's the most interesting thing and then take a question of a person and kind of uh, extract the variables from it 
and plug it into a function mm -hmm. and then get the results back and then tell them back. So it, to me, the most uh, exciting thing about large language model is agents with tools. Okay. That's the most exciting thing about models, uh, large language models. And, and, and the, the reason is it's, it's at least something I can trust, right? Um, in, in my line of work, we have a lot of models that we trust because they've been built by domain experts. You know, you're not going to be asking a large language model, uh, you know, predict, you know, uh, what's the best planting date for this crop in this place. I mean, I guess you could, and they would come up with something, you know, which, which is kind of hit sometimes and miss mm -hmm. most of the yes. time. But I mean, we wouldn't want to use that. So like, I think the exciting part is taking uh, the models that we already have and make use of them through a large language model. I think that can create a lot of, um, it's not just a question of, okay, let's use large language models just because it's the coolest tech there yeah. is. No, it's just also a question of, I mean, people have a lot of questions about predictions, you know, but they don't know what other ways can we engage with models that is not like restrictive. Yes. Like when, when you give a person, a, 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 you know, any kind of uh, model with a predictive capability, they're like, uh, okay, pulling some knobs back and forth. And maybe in the best case scenario, it might show them some charts, maybe an explanation of how it worked, you know, um, you know, some transparency to it. Right. But most of the time it just gives you this is the answer, 89. Mm -hmm. And then you do whatever you do with it. Um, to me, that's like, that's not great. I think we should be able to talk to our models. Mm. And, uh, um, and I'm not, I'm not talking necessarily to the LM, but to the, <laughs> to the models. And that's, that's great for explainability because that means like we can ask questions of how do you arrive to the response, uh, to this, to this outcome, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of variables were involved, which ones were like most, uh, most important to this, you know, whatever you want to disclose or you can disclose about the model, you can do that directly through the user, through the LM. And to me, that's super exciting. Yeah. It, <laughs> um, um, one thing, uh, sorry, I interviewed uh, Mike Tamir. Um, he's he's another popular machine learning person like yourself. And I think one of the things that he reminded me or like brought to the forefront of my mind, previously a lot of our interaction with machine learning systems has been in the native feature space of the data. So whatever features that we come up with, you know, there's some big vector space where this data lives and we're now trying to understand the data as it exists in that environment. And now we're in this world where language is a native form of interaction and, and language is a um, sort of native form of description of the data almost. So it's, it's the first time I think in history that we can model with language <laughs> in addition to modeling with all of the feature techniques that we had before. So it's something like there's, there's harmony in, in what you're saying there. Yeah. I, I think it's another thing that I like is provenance. And I think one of the worst things about the way uh, data is practiced, and I'm not just talking about models, but it, data science mm -hmm. in general, like in, in consumer facing products, even not only consumer, but business facing products as well. Like there's, there's a lack of transparency in the sense that, you know, most of the time there's in a model card, you know, we don't know like the basic things of how was this train, you know, where, where did this information come mm -hmm. from? Uh, you know, let's trace it back to the source. We can't do that. But with a large language model, like there's hope that can be done, you know, like, because like, even if we use like a technique like RAG, retrieval augmented generation, or the one I told you about agent with tools, any kind of tool, I, it, Every, every response we get from the large language model could come with, okay, this is the source, mm -hmm. click on it. So, you know, you can see where it came from. And so to me, that's very exciting. Yes. <laughs> because it means that we can go beyond like these like very opaque systems. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, that, that leads to trustworthy AI, which is the only road where we can actually have 
mass adoption of AGI. Is, is that trustworthiness? Huh. One of, the, one of the things that stuck out to me, so you said earlier that in the EDA process, they, exp, they explore, uh, let's say ETL or uh, data analysis. So I'm exploring my data and trying to understand what's happening. Yeah. A part of that pipeline is actually doing modeling to inform you of, let's say, feature importance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So it sounds like LLMs are another modeling component in that pipeline for you to do EDA to a degree? Actually, I I haven't done that, but that's a good idea. I mean, yeah, like I guess some people, I I think I have, but not with that purpose, just out of curiosity. Like you, you can, you can give like a CSV or like access to a database to a LLM and, and, and tell it, tell it to do summary statistics or, or find some anomaly or something mm-hmm. like that. And basically what's going to do, it, it usually runs like on, on, on REPL, uh, which is, is a, is a fancy way of saying, okay, it's going to generate some Python code and then it's going to run it and then it's going to evaluate the response. Uh, and then it's gonna, if it has good results, it's gonna, it's gonna return them back to you. Otherwise, it's gonna retry. Yep. Right. Um, so you can you can certainly do that through REPL. All uh, right. And um, and so it's um, it's it's a good toolkit to actually explore data. Um, what I found is like, I mean. I can write the pandas code. I don't need the LM to write okay, the pandas okay. code or or to explore write the SQL or or whatever. I mean, but and in and if I wanted it to write SQL, I would be very specific. Okay, this is SQL. Right? Yes. But I mean, some people are comfortable with that. They're like, okay, it's gonna give me more productivity in the sense that I mean I just type something. It just depends how quick you are in typing versus in writing. Hmm. So I'm I don't know to what extent this is going to get more advanced to the point where it's going to understand instruction, where I can verbally tell it, I need this and this and this, like a secretary is going to do it exactly like I asked it to. Um, if, if that's the case, you know, obviously voice is quicker than typing. And, and sometimes if I'm typing anyway, it's probably quicker to type the SQL than to write the instructions. So. That's that's what leads me to to do it the way I do it. But yeah. maybe there are other ways of cutting corners. Mm. Well, tell me what you think about this. So one of the hardest problems in training LLMs is the training data mixtures. You know, what, how much are the example I like to give is how much of Reddit, how much of Wikipedia, how much of, how much Python code, how much mm. C code should I put into this model to give it uh, some actualized intelligence for a domain? Uh, so we just talked about how language models can maybe now be put into your modeling framework of, hey, also use a language model to interpret your data. Do you think that LLMs themselves can be used to to interpret what the best training data mixture is for LLMs? So it's this kind of a inception kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, if it has, if it can... You can create an agent that trains models, yeah, and then evaluates them. So if, if you give it access hmm. to unlimited amount of compute, you could probably <laughs> do that. I mean, you would end up with a very expensive yeah. bill, you know, like uh, basically you, you, you give it access to all the different parameters. In this case, what would the parameters be? Okay, a percentage for each mm-hmm, thing. Okay, mm-hmm. this much Reddit, this much Stack Overflow, this much that, right? And you give it that, and okay, tweak on these hyperparameters and arrive to the best conclusion. But then my question to you would be like, why don't you just do like Bayesian hyperparameter tuning on that? Why do you need the large language model to do mm. that? To me, it has to be a lot more complex, require a little bit more interpretation of results than something that you would do through a, one of these other search mechanisms. Yeah. I, huh. um, maybe, you know. Maybe it's it's like several levels of hyperparameters that needs to tweak, and, and you're like, okay, I can't be bothered with coming up with the best like algorithm to kind of optimize all of them at once. So uh, I'll just let the large language model to give a go. Yeah, I, I think I was coming from the perspective of when you have when you download the internet, 
summarizing the internet or parts of the internet could be quite tricky to do with statistics. Because right now, what, what would you do? You would remove, you would have certain filters to remove nefarious text. You might try to summarize things. So it, it's just an interesting um, sort of thought experiment. Yeah. No, I I think where it's going to get tricky is is when like the, when the, uh, what is it? The uh, snake is eating its own yeah. tail. Oh, definitely. Where <laughs> you basically you've created so much content mm. that you're mm. you're feeding the content back to the LLM yeah. that you that it generated. Then it's not going to seem natural mm. because already like large language model text doesn't seem natural. And to me, that's kind of odd because it's like, what is its training data then? You know, like something tweaked the distribution of things. Okay. You know, whether it was because. There is an aspirational quality mm -hmm. to what we choose to be like our, you know, what would be like, for instance, let's say I, I asked, I was one of the evaluators for my large language model. And I'm like, I'm going to, let's call it like the human trainers for the reinforcement learning mechanism. And I'm, I'm, I'm my task to the large language model is to generate like a response to an email. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so it generates like 10 different responses. And for whatever reason, like people have the tendency to choose the longest, like most eloquent, like, you know, fruitiest of them all, right? You know, like I would never write that, but I'm like, you know, like in an ideal world where I'm like really eloquent, that's what I would mm -hmm. write. And let's say like so many different evaluators chose the same kind of response. So then you have the, the reinforcement learning. Um, part of it, uh, the human feedback kind of just tweet, kind of uh, diverged that the distribution mm -hmm. patterns so that now it's writing very verbose, kind of super like pretentious kind of yes. text. And so mm -hmm. that's not how people write. You know, like they probably, but like what is like the alternative? You know, maybe the alternative is that it would have taken cues from Reddit and it's writing some really rude like kind of short stuff that, mm. you know, that uses like really uh, tween slang and things like that. That in my dislike. <laughs> you know, that, that's been making me think a yeah. lot about uh, what is cheating. So in the future, what would be cheating on an assignment? So if I write, I wonder if in the future, in the next five years, if I write crappy English, because I didn't pay attention in English class, if that actually makes me a better writer, because I'm actually, you know, it's coming from me because it's, it might be crappy versus, let's say, some LLM that's, as you're saying, quite, quite eloquent. Um, especially yeah. in social media, I, mean, I, I think it might become more apparent where someone will know. Because now I, personally, I can know when a, a thing is generated by some LLM and you see the formatting, you'll see all the emojis. You're like, okay, that's an output of an LLM. Oh, maybe I should or should not pay attention to that. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't know if, if it picked up on a trend. Right. I mean, I, I know at least before not, not to claim, you know, like I invented it or anything, but before like, um, LLM started to appear. I was putting emojis in my LinkedIn mm -hmm, posts, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I knew like, and, and the reason is I, I, I thought it made like the content more vibrant, like, mm -hmm. lively and more attractive and that, you know, uh, and now like I asked the LLM anything, it's going to give me a bunch of emojis. And I'm like, I don't need this for, <laughs> you know, an email. Like, why would I send my boss a bunch of like, you know, like emojis? <laughs> I don't know, like it, it got confused somewhere down the line and it thinks it, it applies to everything. Yes. But you're right, like people, it, there's something in natural by the way it, it, it types and it doesn't learn your style ever, mm. you know, which I, I'm sure there is a startup somewhere that's like, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna train an LLM for you based on your content. Yes, like, so I actually want to work on that. <laughs> you know, secretly, but well, it's no longer a secret because I just said it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you should also create like, uh, you know, some kind of uh, generative AI for Trinidadian. I, I do. Uh, I, it, English. It's funny. Like, um, so in Trinidad, 
we have a genre of music called soca and it's very sort of specific yeah. to the region but it also encapsulates a lot of the nuances and uh, we make fun of a very political topic etc but it's all fun and it's all in, in a certain groove so it'd be interesting to just see how can a language model pick up on a lot of those cultural semantics and and write broken queen's english or a terrible absolutely terrible english mm-hmm. but it, it makes perfect sense to someone in that region um that's that's what gets me excited about mm-hmm. when language models become less um and does it happen with with like a lot of like dialects where there is like a a setting where people speak more formally mm-hmm. and one where they speak with more like the the local dialect um oh yeah I'm not saying that necessarily speaking the Queen's English, but you know, like oh yeah, 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 yeah you'll, you'll see that for sure. Like, right, you'll, you'll see a politician come on TV and you know talk about, and you talk to the politician behind the scenes and like, hey boy, we're seeing you know, da, 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 and and you could see the accent yeah. modulation and and the also the vocabulary modulation as well in in different settings. So um, I think language models have have a way to go. I had an interesting question about mixture of experts. So that's all the rage today. Um, I'm assuming there's some type of approaches for interpreting uh, a large language model. Just now we were talking about using a large language model to help us interpret, but now we want to interpret the large or try to understand the large language model, the inner workings. Um, How does that look like in in a mixture of experts paradigm? I... Honestly, haven't cool. gone down that right, rabbit right. hole. I can't tell you. I have, I have for large language models. I mean, in a nutshell, well, you'll find pretty much every open source large language model mm-hmm. out there, and including ChatGPT. Deep down, they're, they're just predicting the next yes. token. The version we use is the struct mm-hmm. version, uh, which is just uh, you know a downstream task from that. So it's just an a- added layer to that. That's yep. all. But you can you can take the one that predicts the next token and you can interpret it. There's there's so many tools to do that, um, and uh, I I explain them in the book. Yes, I saw that chapter. So you you have one, yeah. So you you can take. I use the Bert bottle because it, it's small. Yes. I mean, you could do the same with Yama if you have enough GPUs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, power. You could. I think you could do that with uh, Yama for sure. I I tried. Um, but not the struct version. Okay. The struct version it adds a layer of complexity to mm. it because instead of predicting the next token, it's, it's taking a prompt. Um, and, and then based on that prompt, it's, it's, it's preparing a response. Yes. So there's, there's far more complexity mm-hmm. to it. Um, there isn't a tool that can, that can intrinsically look at the, the, uh, at the, at all the different layers and kind of, uh, encapsulate some kind of understanding of that from you know using it, the internal mechanics of the model but uh, there are a bunch of other mechanisms for understanding outputs of instruct model uh, of instruct model. Oh. so um, those those would be okay you know consistency metrics mm-hmm. uh, things having to do with uh, you know if if I run this a uh, hundred times, you know what kind of words pop up the most, so you come out create with some kind of tree, you know, decision tree of what what are like the most used most common uh, terms or words. bigrams or trigrams. Or, yeah, yeah, mm. exactly, exactly. So you you can do so many things with that, um, but I mean that that is definitely kind of some form of post hoc interpretability uh, on a very basic level. It might it might not give you like a sense of you know feature importance or anything like that. There's, there's all, but there's other things that you can do that are very interesting with common factuals as well. Like what if I phrase this prompt differently? Mm-hmm. What if I change this word for this one? So that's where, interesting enough, that's where like prompt engineering is gonna collide with the field of you know, interpretable machine yes. learning. And, um, and it, in a way, prompt engineering sometimes is adversarial, which is another chapter in my mm-hmm. book. Um, adversarial robustness because you can actually trick the model to reveal its secrets. You can you can trick the model to do a lot of things that it shouldn't be doing. So, and you can iterate. It's just a question of change. What do I change in the input so I can 
make the output something favorable or where I, or I can see like the trends with output. Like, so if I, if I change this word for this one or this one, this, this is the kind of output I get. This is the distribution of my trigrams, bigrams, or whatever it is I want to analyze yes. in my output. Um, and then if, if I, if I change this, for this, then all of a sudden I, I, I kind of open like a back door of some sort. And then I got this weird output that has no kind of um, connection to the other mm -hmm. one. You know, so it's, it's very interesting because it's very similar to the kind of things that you, you find in other kind of neural networks anyway. Yeah. You know, huh. those kind of really counterintuitive, you could call them back doors, but like they're not really, they're not there by, some of them are not there by design, right. you know. Like in the same way, like sometimes you could say, well, there's this method called uh, SEM, which is contrastive explanation method. And, um, and it's, it, it kind of works on these two sides. What is what has to be minimally present in the input so that I can get this output? Right. Right. So, mm -hmm. and what has to be minimally absent from my from my input so that I get this other one. So like, for instance, I could say, well, if I get, if I input a completely black image with these three or four pixels, then it's going to be classifying it as a cat. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, that doesn't look like a cat. Why, why these random pixels? You know, um, that is if it was an image classifier, but I'm, I'm sh the same kind of methods could work with large language models in the sense that like, maybe there's like, you take your prompt and it's like, you think to ask the large language model this question, you know, like, um, I don't know, what is like, uh, how, how often is the, the limpness yes. happen, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you think, well, that's the way I would phrase it. There's probably like hundreds of ways of mm -hmm. phrasing it. Mm -hmm. But then you ask, well, what is the minimal amount of tokens I can use to get the same yeah. answer? So what is the canonical right? form of that maybe, question, essentially? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And maybe it could come up with three or four. Or maybe it would come up with something that, you know, you would never think of because it's complete nonsense. It's gibberish, right? Uh, that's, that's kind of what's interesting about these models. I mean, obviously, since there's no kind of causal connection between mm -hmm. anything, you know, like it's just like, it could be nonsense could lead to Brilliant. something that makes sense. Yes. And something that makes sense could lead to nonsense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a good point. It's ex exciting times in, in interpretable yeah. machine learning, especially for LLMs. I think you'll always, you'll always have a job. Uh, so you're writing a, a new book called DIY AI. Yeah. I love the title. Tell us more about it. Yeah. Well, this all stems from a place of, of, of frustration. Okay. You know, we've been talking about interpretable machine learning. I, I, I love the mm -hmm. space. Um, I love what it stands for, which is mostly like quality work. Um, you know, as I said, quality assurance, responsible AI, um, trustworthy products. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, but the, the thing is like, I, I think it was a couple of years ago. And then I repeated the, the experiment last year. I went through all the different uh, uh, GitHubs and, and PIP download statistics for the packages that are most used in mm -hmm. Python. And, and to my surprise, like, it's just dismal, like the amount of downloads, the number of likes that the libraries in the responsible AI mm. space get in comparison to Ooh, everything else. Interesting. And, and the gap gets smaller and smaller. Don't get me wrong, the interest in responsible AI has never been mm. higher, but comparatively, it hasn't The implementation up of it hasn't to, caught up, essentially. Mm. No, no. And, and so like, yeah, you go to conferences and there's always a few talks on responsible AI, but you know, you get a sense that people aren't really applying the tools because Otherwise, they'd be just as many downloads for, you know, I don't Pandas know, as one library than, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, yeah, exactly. Maybe Pandas. not <laughs> nearly as much as Pandas or, or PyTorch or something like that. But yeah, you will get, uh, you know, it would have increased over the years, mm. at least at the same rate. And it hasn't. Wow. So I, I started to realize, well, it's, it's 
it's not like I'm following deaf ears. There's, there's interest in the space. Mm -hmm. It just, it needs to go through this uh, growing pains that other fields have gone through. I see. And, and, and the problem is it's, it's like it's 1995 and people are interested in the internet, mm -hmm. but not everybody has a modem yet. Not everybody's using it or, or they, they, they're kind of getting the benefit of it because some business they work with is using it, but they're not directly. So uh, they don't have a website yet. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, here are the tools. I, I, the tent has to be bigger. More people have to engage with the technology, yes. even on the basic level before it is broken in, mm. you know, and when it's broken in, that's when the technology will mature to the point that we care enough to fix these problems. I see. My fear is that we're going to get to the point where we feel we need to fix them before it goes through that, that kind of logical mm. step, you know, the kind of um, hobbyist step. Right. Like every technology we, we've seen so far over the last century has gone through this step, you know, the hobbyists that created their own, their, their own like uh, cars before Ford put his factory, there were like hundreds of like people creating their own mm -hmm, cars mm -hmm. just for fun, you know, in a completely unregulated space. Yes. Yeah. Completely do it yourself. That's what it was. And, and it, it's been like that with every, every like major technology. And I, I mentioned the internet back in the internet. I, I, as a teenager, I was like one of these geeks that was making his own websites when nobody knew what a website was. And, uh, I, I think that's where we are. We, we need to have people create their own models. Um, you know, hobbyists do that, um, and, uh, and break them, mm -hmm. you know? And that's, that's how we'll fix things that that's how we'll make them more responsible because it, you know, if it's in the hands of just people that work for companies, they don't see the value necessarily in doing that right. because they're like, well, it's just, it's, I mean, our customers don't need that. They don't need all these explanations, mm -hmm. you know, and there isn't a really a pushback. Um, so that's the genesis of do it yourself. AI, it's just give expanding the tent. And so what it, what it is, is basically. It's, it's a 10 chapter book, uh, two are like introductory, mm -hmm. four on discriminative AI okay. and four on generative mm -hmm. AI. And each chapter is okay, a project. Okay. So uh, the, the projects range from facial recognition, sound classification to uh, uh, deep fakes and uh, you know, generating music. So, the idea is like these are things people can do at home mm -hmm. with their own equipment. Uh, they just need some programming knowledge, um, and and just kind of kind of interest in the topic. Yes. I mean, in fact, I wouldn't say they need a lot of programming knowledge. It's just uh, an interest because that's kind of a rabbit hole. If they're really interested in the the topic, they can right. learn. And and this is not just only for people that are. Um, there's a part of me that says this is this is kind of speaks to me too because you know like I I work in a space I work in agriculture like I I only I fool around with other technologies all the mm -hmm. time right um, and I'm sure there's data scientists out there that day in day out they they do like they work in finance so they know quite a bit of you know financial data science and financial models but that doesn't necessarily mean they've ever played with a sound classifier. Right. So like this, this could be for them mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's exciting. Um, yeah, I've, I've interest, recently shifted what I consider knowing something um, to being able to build a product. So before you would understand a concept, let's say I'm doing distributed training of LLMs. Not many people have access to thousands of GPUs to actively go through that process to say I've trained. That I've pre-trained a large language mm. model. Very few people in the world have that opportunity. Mm. Um, but now I'm sort of shifting to very similar to what you're saying. We're talking about all these things. We understand them. We know they're important. We kind of know how they work, but the doing, the, the actual bringing into reality is, is the difficult part. So for, at least for me personally, 
I now measure myself in terms of if I can build a product out of it, I understand it. If I can't build a product out of it, yeah. then I there's I don't fully understand it, and that's that's been a new guiding light uh, for me recently. No, I, absolutely. I think we all should be doing that. I think um, I I don't know. I I think the way data science is taught, machine learning is taught, is often wrong. Mm. I mean, it is okay. Here here's a, the simplest example of this. You can do like a toy data set and, and go do it. And now you, you've done it, right? And um, so, you know, there's so many people that their experience is okay. I've, you know, you see their resumes and I've, I've done Titanic, the Iris I did and, Boston housing yeah. and I, yeah, Iris and, you know, certified data scientist right away, right? Um, in, in some cases, maybe they've dealt with like some NLP classifier for, for, for the Amazon, uh, you know, reviews or IEMDV or something like mm -hmm. that. So now I know LDP, right? But to me, it's like, okay, can you do an end-to-end, -end, you know, non-toy data set kind of situation, yes. you know, where data's messy, nobody's touch it but you. Like, can you do that, right? To me, it's more indicative of a person's skill than like, okay, well, I, I took a data set with all my conversations from Facebook over the years. and uh, I wanted to classify, I, I, I say I had maybe over the years, I had these many girlfriends and these, I wanted to do a classifier to see if, you know, it was conversation from a romantic relationship and a non-romantic breakup. <laughs> <laughs> um, been very you know, I don't know why would that make, <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense, no, but you know, I would say that's kind of cool, you know, like that you came up with that project and, executed it end to end and clean the data and did all that. I mean, it's, and maybe they have a use case for it. And like, I wanted to apply it like this, <laughs> yeah, mm. you know, like um, to me, that makes, it's much more impressive than someone working with data that they found somewhere else. And it's just one of thousands of Kaggle projects involving that. Yeah. Um, it's nice to go to these Kaggle projects and get insp inspired on the on okay this person used SVM and this person used this other mechanism mm -hmm. this person did clustering like that you get and that's cool but at the end of the day the exploration part is so important kind of getting that muscle moving where you're just not trying things the same way over and over again because data is different every single mm -hmm. time you can't apply the process to every single project. And, and that's missed out on a lot of people. They think it's the same project. It's, it's more an opportunity to play than anything else. That's why I keep saying, like if I created a, a school for data yeah. science, it would be a Montessori school. Mm. It would be like, everything's like, okay, building blocks and Lego and just explore. Like there's no, I mean, there is a good way of doing things, but there's many ways of doing that, of, of getting there, right? So hmm. like, it, it might seem like it's, it's like wrong right. from the get-go, but it's, it's all, data is very malleable, you know? There's so many ways of making it fit, you know? And, 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 and you know, so I, I'm not one of those people that say, okay, it's, even though there is like more or less a, a road there, there's like, first you have to explore and then you have to, but exploring doesn't necessarily like exclude so many, as we talked earlier, you know, it doesn't necessarily exclude model. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily exclude, uh, you know, engagement with, uh, you know, stakeholders and presentation. People say, Oh, presentations last. No, if presentation goes throughout, you know, how else are you supposed to get feedback and all of these things? Bounce ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, one is I secretly wanted to, also, I think I still secretly want to be a web developer just because um, I think the data scientist role, if, if we just look at that role in itself, is becoming more of a software engineering role. Like the less that you know about software engineering, the less effective I think you can be as an enterprise data scientist. That's what I've sort of learned over my career. So I think one of the cool things you can do in your book is to make sure folks have a, a very firm understanding of that end-to-end -end communication of processes. I, I find that quite interesting, especially as you start to get into distributed systems and um, how all these different microservices yeah. are speaking to each other. 
I do think that's a barrier to entry for a lot of data scientists in in playing. Yeah. No. Well, the, the idea the the book is not about making data scientists. I mean, it is about it's an introduction. Yes. It's a taste. But it's getting people so hands on, I, I dirty, wanna, doing I, things. Hands on, hands on for sure. But it's not like okay. Every every project is a Docker container mm. with Circle CI and whatnot. No, no. I mean, I can't go that far gotcha. in because it's it's already daunting. Mm. I mean, Fair even point. I I I realized that the a lot of people say, okay, well, like you shouldn't teach data science through notebooks, and mm. and part of it is like, yeah, kind of. It's the thing is, it tells a story, right. so there's mm. that. But at the same time, like. It is to some people like that never programmed before. The the the, the narrative of things going through not quite object oriented mm. programming, but through functions does make a lot yes. of sense. You say, okay, well, we're not quite going to create a class mm -hmm. yet, but we're going to create a main function, and this is going to run like a script, and you have this, and everything's like really clear, cleanly delineated. The only thing that's missing is the class on the top and then make everything part of the class and put the self and all the rest of the other yes. stuff. Right. Um, I mean, that's already on the road there, I think. And th that's one of the cool things of Python. It makes it easy to kind of transcend into that direction mm -hmm. without getting too deep mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I've, I've seen data scientists take that journey and they're like, at first they're like, because at first it's just all sequential. Like if, you know, like there's no functions, it's a whole mess. And it's like, okay, you're repeating this code here. Go one level Put up, it in a abstract. function and then, okay, mm -hmm. go one level, start to abstracting mm -hmm. things. And then little by little, okay, uh, you know, now you can put this function in a function and then, okay, what if you took it out? You know, then you can reuse it for this other things. And like sooner or later, it's, it has all the bones there. It just needs, it just needs to be connected in a skeleton. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's just. Makes sense it just becomes much more intuitive. And, and so like, that's why the, the code wise, the book is okay. We're, 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 it's all scripts, everything mm -hmm. scripts and not quite a uh, big module. Like the, and... the best practices. Yeah. The best practices, because I don't, I don't want it to be daunting from the get go. I want people to feel like, okay, they can work with this because I'm just explaining, okay, pieces of code and functions, yes. and that's it. And there's no like necessary. There's no I that okay. You have to understand all of a sudden how all these different like mechanisms in computer science mm -hmm. work. Okay, now I have to teach them class, class inheritance, and distractions, and and it's too much. Too things. much makes sense. Um, do you yeah. have Do you have ten minutes after this to take you going? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I wanted to, yeah. to shift into some career advice. So you've written, I yeah. think, two books now, or two versions of books, <laughs> very, very lengthy yeah. books. What advice do you have for folks um, wanting to write a book and who should not write a book? Hmm. Who should not yeah. write a book? Maybe that question first. Who um, should not write a book? I know. It's someone that has no passion for mm. um, teaching others. I Ooh. think that's the only thing. Okay. I like that criteria. But, but even then, I think, I think books, I mean, if you see it as an exercise in writing, mm -hmm. like journaling, mm -hmm. uh, it's all right. I mean, you could write a book for yourself. Fair there's enough. nothing wrong yeah. with that. I mean, there's some people that take notes. I mean, I, I'm, I wasn't like in, in college, I wasn't at that level of note taker, but there were some people as notes where it's so immaculate and like, you know, if you type this up, this could be a book, yes. you know, that's how mm -hmm. good it is. Like there's some people that do that. I mean, I, I don't, if you're that sort of person, why not write a book for yourself? <laughs> that's why you, you can keep like even cleaner like notes and you can review them later and you can search mm -hmm. through them. I mean, uh, and some people are already doing that through like Notion, uh, more yeah. tool mm -hmm. Notion and so forth, already kind of doing that already. Yep. So, um, and uh, what, what I think about book writing, there's, there's like, I, I think there has to be like, if, if you want to make like a public facing book, has to be a, a passion to 
uh, instruct mm-hmm. others. And also it's, you learn a lot through the writing. You, you, you think you know a subject and, and then some, you, you'll, you'll be surprised how many things you learn throughout the process. There's been like some new uh, application for what you, know, you thought, or maybe something you thought was called like this was actually called like this. And then you feel like a fool because you've been telling everybody about this method and you're like calling it the wrong name all this time. And, and there's a bunch of things like that you learn throughout the process. Mm. So you, I, I, th- I think people that teach courses also go through the same experience yes. when they're, they're writing the, the slides or the notes or whatever kind of delivery process they use for uh, their teaching materials. They realize by writing that, by kind of organizing the thoughts, they've learned things better. And every time they discuss the subject, with someone, whether it's in a podcast or in a class or, you know, in a conference, they're like, I understand this better than before. Mm-hmm. And I wrote the book on it. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem like it, it can get better, but it, it can. I think it's, it's a continual process. I'm glad you articulated that. So, it, so one advice for people is that um, one, they should have the passion and then two, just expect that they don't know everything right out the gate. To have the basically you don't have the book completed in your head you have an idea and then you go explore no and, and make it happen no i i had no clue mm. i mean the the for my book i didn't i didn't set out to write it to, to be honest i i wrote an article oh okay 600 uh, pages the by subject. Way. your book yeah, is no, now 600 pages this is no, interesting it, yeah yeah i i wrote an article and, and what happened, and this was at the beginning of the pandemic, someone from PACT reached out to me and they're like, would you like to write the book? And to me, it was really odd because it's like, okay, I know like 10 people in this space that at least mm-hmm, 10, mm-hmm. I mean, probably there's hundreds, but I know at least 10 that are like experts and know way more than I do because I'm reading their material. Right to come up with my stuff, it would with, come up with my article, right? So they must have asked them and they said, no, <laughs> you know, like what other reason would be the contact, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but they did. And so like, I, I don't know, I never thought about that, but it, I mean, the pandemic was going on. I was feeling like I, I could use some distraction and uh, I, I don't know, what's the worst that can yes. happen. And so I, I came up, I, I collected all my ideas on, you know, what could be in a book like this. And then I put an outline and I sent it to them because no, it was, there was a condition to it. It was like, if we like the outline you mm-hmm. send, send us, we'll move forward. you're okay. the, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so they liked the outline, outline I sent them and they had already picked the title for the book. And, and to be quite honest, it's not like I was writing, you know, articles on hundreds of different subjects. You know, I wrote this one article on one subject. That was it. Um, and that, that was the one topic I would have, if someone would have said, oh, would you write, want to write a book? But I would have written about that topic. That's okay. it. So, I mean, it, it kind of fit at the right yes. time. No, this is exciting. I, I, as I ex- interview more and more people, you know, a lot of the folks who are authors, I'm, I'm getting to know them. And it's just interesting to, to know the human being and their journey behind writing a lot of these fantastic books that educate thousands and potentially millions of people, you know, over the next couple of years. So that's, that's very exciting. I'm, I'm very big on career ad- advice or I, um, I explore the space of career. So I, I try to understand why people do what they do. Uh, so just like in machine learning, there's an objective function where we try to minimize error. What is your career mm-hmm. objective function? What are you maximizing or minimizing for? Is it time? Is it money? Enjoyment? Any any thoughts around that? And naturally, it shift. It probably would have shifted over time. But um, can you can you share your 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 way of thinking? Well, right now, as a new father, uh, I'm uh, sleep. I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, there there is definitely that sleep, but there's also. Um, so I, I, I think I want to, there's this need also, since it's already kind of happening, mm-hmm. like 
feel like every day I'm 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 feeling more paternal, mm-hmm. <laughs> more like I I I want to share what I know. Uh-huh. Okay. So like I'm already embracing the role of elder, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. um guy in the space and and someone that has and and you know you would think well you got uh, you started that journey with the book and maybe sort of you know little by little I started to embrace it but like now it's like okay now this this has to be more of what I yeah. am and so uh, I'm moving more in that direction mm-hmm. and I I get enjoyment from that I get enjoyment from mentoring others and 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 learning from because I think they learn from me but I learn from yes. them and it reinforces what you're what you're doing a, as well right that you're on the right path and it's it yeah. ideas yeah 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 so the reason my objective function is is probably really complex i mean it has so many different things is it it. it's not like one thing it's not like <laughs> no <laughs> no no i mean because if it could fluctuate okay. yeah it does um i mean even i don't know i'm i'm just there isn't like a long-term vision mm. to it i just go by it like year by year i think i i don't i i set out on this data science journey with the idea of just learning, um, of course, make a living. Sure. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, be broke, but um, I, I, I wanted to, you know, get like a lot of from mm-hmm. it, you know, from the experience. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be able to learn from it. I wanted to grow from it. I wanted to uh, meet other, connect with other yes. people in mm-hmm. the space. Mm-hmm. That's why even when I was studying the topic. When I, because I went off and got a master's in data science many years ago. And when I was a student, I was like, I have to go to every conference in this space. Because I, it wasn't just a question of, okay, I couldn't meet my potential employer. Of course, that was on mm-hmm. my mind. But I also, and, and not that that ever happened. I never got a job directly from, from the conference. But the coolest thing is I met people that were really like-minded yes, and they were living it and i was like okay i i i found my clan mm. you know like i found my people <laughs> yeah that's that's how i felt and to me it was like uh something unexpected because i don't know why i just thought it would be like really transactional like really like everything was networking you know or just like you know but it it, it felt like you were meeting friends left and right and there was a kingship and there was like okay camaraderie and and that's that's a, something I was in web development for so many years. I never saw that really? in that space. Oh. I would go to the conferences. Hmm. No, it's so weird. I didn't. I didn't. Maybe I, it was the kind of the approach I had, the kind of person I was, or maybe it just simply it wasn't there where where you know where I was looking. Hmm. You know? How has your web development background helped you as a data scientist? Well, it, it's made me very product oriented. Mm, okay. You know, I mean, it's it's hard. It it was hard originally in the work where I am because you know, like it it's heavy on the R and D, and and so they're not quite in that part of the mm. pipeline in a lot of sense. You know, where at least where it was originally. Now I'm like more on the product yes. side, but like I I'm always thinking about the user. I'm always thinking about mm-hmm. you know my model as part of a product you know because that's that's where i envision it i can't think of it in another way because to me it's like okay what's the point i'm thinking about kpis i'm thinking about all these other things and it's it's all that also comes from my startup background but i was already thinking in terms of kpis because like early on like i remember web development where like the only way you would get like visitor information was if you dug deep into server logs and and kind of parse that data Mm -hmm. so i would create these pearl scripts that would read the 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 visitor logs and tell me how many visitors i had where they came from things like that and i I thought that was always so cool and and that that of course was a feedback loop i didn't understand quite the mechanics Mm -hmm. that it was until later that i started to realize the power in that feedback loop but it, it was always there that it, that data driven mentality of, okay, we were getting feedback from our users, you know, whether like uh, on purpose or not, you know, like even even them staying for a few minutes on a page it's telling us something. to me was indicative mm-hmm, of something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
like and sometimes it, it comes in the form of a message sometimes it comes in the form of uh clicking on a on a link or you know so that's feedback and you get it and you start to interpret all that and you're like oh i could improve this website like this i could improve the flow like that and do this it seems that people like this part and and why is it in the back of the of the tree mm -hmm. you know why do they have to go through five levels to get here if that's what they're looking for so like i started to respond like this wherever i work that's how i started to think and i started to move in that direction and then i realized that there was a whole field devoted to that and so i got deep into everything involved on the analytics side of web development you know seo I mean, I never held the title of SEO guy, but there was times that's what mm -hmm. I did, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and also like conversion optimization. Once it became a term, I'm like, I've been doing this all this time, <laughs> and I started to get all the tools because, of course, as much as I would write a script and do that, there was nothing like using like a tool that was built yeah. for that. So yeah, once you had these tools that would dynamically change your web page, mm. you know, randomly, and you could run all these A/B tests. I was all for that, you know. Um, I guess that was my my first foray into actual like statistical analysis, you know, because you do averages and things like that, but A/B tests. And um, so I, I mean, I started doing that stuff, and then it was until, you know, a few years later, I started to realize, what am I doing here? I mean, I care about the product because I'm very product oriented. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be building the product. You know, by then I was already like the webmaster and I had people working for me and they were all focused on the product. So they would I would send them tickets and and projects and they would do all that stuff and I would be focused on the data, but I didn't want to be even in charge of that. Right. I mean, on the engineering side. To me, I, the most exciting thing was sifting through the data, preparing reports meeting with my uh, uh, my uh, bosses and my colleagues and saying, okay, uh, I have this idea of how we can improve this, or I've seen these metrics are down here. This is, this is how we can collaborate to improve it. Um, so I, I started moving so much in that direction that I was like, forget about the, the, the building part. I don't want to be building stuff mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, that kind of stuff. I, I want to be focused on the data. <laughs> Focus on the data. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, what's one piece of advice that you have for, as we get a little closer to the end, <clears throat> what's one piece of advice you have for a, a high schooler, a person in college, and a professional? And this could be general career advice, life advice, things that have sort uh, of allowed you to make progress. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 think, um, I think the advice is probably the same. Okay. Um, well, for the college, um, high school, high, high, well, high school is super them, important. I, high yeah. school, e explore, 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 okay. explore things. Uh, I mean, more than drugs, of course. <laughs> I mean, if that's what they do, <laughs> I mean, because that's, <laughs> that's a part that's, of the when you say explore, process, yeah. that's, that's not that I'm advocating yeah. for that. What I'm saying is, you know, like explore data and, um, the pro um, projects, uh, passions, interests, um, um, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think exploration, like knowledge is like turned into, especially during high school, it's like, okay, these are like the distinct things you have to learn. Mm. And, uh, you know, you have to pick, a, you know, one of these careers and, and then move forward. And, and to me, the, you know, it's like, it's, it's not that discreet. You can mix and match these things. I mean, someone with interest in music could realize, oh, I can make music with AI. Right. Or I could, you know, uh, there's no reason I can't learn programming to do mm -hmm. that, you know. Or, or someone with interest to in sports, skateboards, and whatnot could realize, okay, well, I, I mean, I can study, you know, kinetics. You know, I can become an expert in, in movement mm -hmm. and, and apply this in this way and, and improve it, it, you know, the field by understanding, uh, you know, the movement of human bodies, you know, like there's so many different areas, yes. like, you know, engineering and science and not only the STEM field, but in general, like there's just so many different disciplines, like, and it, for, for a person in high school, 
I wish I understood there were just so many different subfields. You mm -hmm. know, even now I, I work in agriculture and I'm, I never thought it was this exciting. I thought it was that's, like That's the future. Not food security thing. We didn't I get mean, to talk about that, but food yeah, security I, is huge. Yeah. I, and I thought biology was boring. <laughs> so I, I, but the thing is, nobody ever explained, you know, there's just so much to it. You know, even math, I, I didn't know like linear algebra was so exciting, mm -hmm. but the thing is, they don't let you go down these rabbit holes enough to understand how, you know, how they're applied in the yes. field, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it's not so much you have these tools, this is how they're, they're applied. This is what's exciting about them. And that, that's, that's, you know, I'm sure there are people like that communicate this through TikTok. There's, there's probably people that, that learn a lot of these things. But I'm saying like in formal education and, and a lot of other avenues, they're not really discussed. Mm -hmm. And unless you kind of happen to stumble upon a video in TikTok about, you know, exciting field of, I don't know, like topology or whatever, you know, nobody's going to learn about whatever they're truly like uh, uh, going to be passionate about like mm -hmm. 10 years or could be potentially passionate about. And um, in, in college, I, I guess people have already made that choice. And I think the, the, the point is a lot of people in college think, okay, I decided this is it's final. And what I realized is that in data science, there's people that that come from so many mm -hmm, different fields, mm -hmm. so many different areas. Yes. Like I did chemical engineering. So um, <laughs> stumble upon machine learning and I was yeah. like, oh, we get paid well. Let me exactly. Go <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, don't, don't think that what you decide is final in college. There's just so many different ways, especially now, mm -hmm. like it used to be someone would stay in the same job in the same career for so many years. It was just so common. Now they have the ability to change. Right. And so this, the sooner you start to uncover more or less what direction you're going to go to, the, the easier it is for you to kind of flexibilize that. Not to say that's impossible, you know, someone that studied, you know, I don't know, dance could become a data scientist. I'm not saying, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm just saying the road there is going to take more twists than someone that studied, I don't know, math, yeah. right? So, I mean, the sooner they start to learn, okay, this is where I, I want to take this. And there are kind of segues. You know, there are definitely some segues for someone between dance and data science, if that's what they want to get into, right? There are for every field. So the it, important thing is to find those segues. Yes. And, and that's often what I tell people in, in, in college. They're like, oh, I want to do machine learning. And I'm like, uh, do you know data yet? <laughs> they're like, no, I just think it's cool. And they're like, you know, become a data analyst first, mm. you know, like take an internship as a data analyst and then then that's like the clearest path, okay. you know. That's interesting. Um, what three books you recommend books read? Could be from any field. And yeah, three yeah. books? Are you a reader? Um, oh, well, Are you a big reader, be, by the way? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, lately, I've, oh, okay. I've read a ton of baby yes, books. Yes. So I'm not going to recommend those <laughs> <laughs> parenting books. Um, yeah. I, I, I mentioned one of them. Actually, it's been a while since I read it, but the, the Book of Why is a good yeah, book. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. It, it went to your causal, um, and then the causal machine learning one from Alexander. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got me thinking only all, all these causal books. Um, <laughs> it was causal. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Um, okay, another topic I'm really interested in is uncertainty, this estimation. Mm. We talked about uncertainty. And so uh, there's there's a book by Valerie Manokin, I think his name is. Um, it's called uh, Conformal Prediction. Oh, okay. Um, uh, conformal. It has some other part mm -hmm. to it. Conformal. Formal prediction. Interesting. Uh, Valerie um, Practical Guide to Applied Conformal oh, Prediction. That's a yes. So, that's a <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so yeah, go, no, no, go you're ahead. Good. you could, if you have any other books, that'll be good. And then I'll, I'll jump into our wrap it no, round. No, no, no. Those, those are the ones that showed up at uh, top of my head. I could think gotcha. of. Gotcha. Okay. So I have a rapid round of three questions. These are just for fun. Um, you're stuck on an Island with a specialized chef who could only cook two meals. You could have any meal that you want. 
Um, but you'll be on this island for, let's say, a decade. What two meals would you choose for this person to cook? Oh, okay. That's a good one. Um, I don't know. I, I think I two meals. One of them would have to be curry. Oh, all right. All right. Now we're talking. I love my yeah, curry. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it could be any curry. <laughs> it could be an Indian curry. It could be a Caribbean mm, curry. Thai curry. I love any kind of mm. curry. Thai curry. I mean, I, I wouldn't be disappointed either way. Okay, so so we have I curry. Mean, curry I mean, as well. I would need a protein in it. I would need a protein mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. in it. That's for sure. Um, the other one. I like, I love Mexican food okay. too. So I think I would go for a burrito. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a burrito and, so, then, and then curry wait. on the side. Interesting. Okay. You're not a, you're not a yeah. pizza person. My last couple, I guess, have all been like on the pizza train. You know. It, it's a, yeah. You know what? I, I, I love pizza, but I don't know. I, I think I would get sick of yeah. it if I had it every I'm, day, I'm, to be honest. Mm, I hear you. Um, what's one thing that brings you joy? Um, well, right now, my yes. son, mm-hmm. <laughs> just looking at him smile. I mean, um, right, right now, like one thing I did, uh, is in my office, I put like, a uh, I have a camera on top of his bassinet mm-hmm. right now. He's sleeping so I can actually nice. see him. I have this, uh, monitor with a raspberry Pi that I equip with all kinds of, um, computer vision stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> I can see him right now. And that'll uh, be a good project for you to put. Are you going to put that stuff. project in your book? That's a nice project, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's a complicated project, and I didn't come up with it okay. until later uh, after I had written like uh, my uh, computer vision chapters. Mm. So uh, I, I could put it in like a companion website. Maybe. I think it'd be fun. I, I think but, yeah, people I would like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure they would like it. Yeah. This last question is. It's not about being famous. It's more so a long-term alignment. What do you want people to remember about you? Oh. This could be a family. This could be a friend. I don't know. I, I, th- I think know. just that, you know, I think the, the nicest thing someone could say about me or anybody is that they're, they're kind to them. Mm. I mean. Simple. I think, I mean, I've, just people have reached out to me in the past and said, oh, I uh, thank you for this advice. That was very kind of you. That to me is all I could, I mean, that's, you know, giving back, giving to people mm-hmm. is, I mean, it gives me a lot of, uh, of satisfaction. Yes. <laughs> it, it, so I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't think I, I want anything uh, to be yeah, yeah, yeah. remembered. No, that was, a, that was a beautiful answer. And, um, like I said, simple and it's pure. Uh, so I wanted to thank you very much for your time coming on the show. And, you know, in the beginning, I, I did say this is probably one of my more difficult interviews just because I, I came in with the expectation that I had to hit you with uh, these very novel questions. So uh, would love your rating out of 10. How did I do on questions? You could tell me I did a, a negative five. That's all. Uh, I, mean. They, I mean, I've never been asked <laughs> about I, food or... <laughs> I mean, books, yes, but not, not food or like <laughs> deserted islands. And I, I thought it was kind of cool, cool, you know, having all these um, rapid fire stuff. Um, kind of, uh, well, yeah. I, yeah. I, I mean, I would, to be honest. No, you got to like, be honest. I would probably ask those at the Interesting. First, at the oh, beginning. Okay. Kind of break ice. Huh. All right. I think they're good icebreaker kind of questions. Hmm. Uh, although the, the reading question. And there's a reading reason why uh, John do it, does it during the mm-hmm. end is kind of good to kind of take away yeah. question. It's like, okay, you you know you want to learn more about the sort. If this per this person reads these books and you like what they've talked about during the podcast, I mean, you'll align with this them. kind of something you mm-hmm. can you'll align with these books. So it's kind of a good kind of takeaway mm-hmm. thing. But the other ones the. Uh, the rapid fire ones are a good kind of like warm up kind of uh, uh, that's interesting feedback break ice breaking kind of questions huh. yeah but th- the rest of it is, yeah really really good very very good appreciate it well once again it, it was a pleasure and um, I hope folks learn a lot from the interview and 
I have a lot more reading to do about interpretable AI, especially in LLMs. Sure. All right, see you. <laughs>